at just after midnight on Thursday morning, the 17th of January 2019, and 21-year-old Palestinian student Aya Masawi happily stepped off the tram at Plenty Road, Bandura, with a spring in her step. She'd had a really good day, practicing her English by attending the regular meetup Let's Talk in English in the city, and then afterwards had gone to the Comics Lounge in North Melbourne to see some comedy and again practice her English. She was five months into her 10-month study exchange at La Trobe University from Shanghai University, and she was having a great time learning English and practicing her social communication at these events. She was getting really good at it. She was glad that she'd chosen Melbourne to come to on exchange instead of New York, and looked forward to showing her sisters around when they came to visit later in the year. After the show, one of her friends dropped her off at Burke Street to catch the tram home to her student accommodation in Bandura. So, just after midnight, she got off the 86 tram on Plenty Road, she crossed the road, and began walking east along the footpath of Main Drive, Bandura, next to the Polaris Shopping Centre. She'd walked this area many times before, and because of what had happened in the past to women like Eurydice Dixon or, or Jill Ma, she decided to call Ruba, her sister, in Israel, on FaceTime. Talking to someone on the phone made her feel safer, and it meant that people wouldn't try to talk to her in the dark of night. She barely walked 100 metres or so when Ruba picked up. Ruba said, Hello, my sister. And Aya replied, I didn't expect you to pick up the phone. Before Ruba had a chance to respond, she heard a blood-curdling scream, followed by the sound of a scuffle and Aya yelling, You piece of shit. She then heard four loud noises like someone being hit, and then everything went quiet. Let's take a stab at this. Hi mates, and welcome to Something About Murder. I'm Jay Something. And every week, I bring you a couple of cases from Australia's true crime history. If this sounds interesting to you, please help us out by shooting the like button with your trusty boomstick, stabbing the subscribe button until it bleeds, and then punching the notification bell in the face to be notified every time we release a new video. All of our episodes are released at the same time in podcast format on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your true crime podcast fix. Welcome to Season 2. We now have something about murder merchandise. Designed by myself, as well as Australian artist Redneck Kung Fu, there's just a few things here and there, but I'll put the link in the description. Suffice to say, somethingaboutmurder.myshopify.com The rape and murder of 21-year-old Palestinian student Aya Masawi in the suburbs of Melbourne in 2018 was the latest in a sickening trend of late-night rapes and murders that have pervaded the city over the past few years. Stories like that of Jill Ma and Eurydice Dixon galvanised Melbourne's women to speak up in anger about their safety on Melbourne's streets, and this was yet another chapter in that awful narrative. A warning, this story does contain details of aggravated physical and sexual assaults. Thank you to Dee from Switchblade Sisters Social Club, brand new crime podcast, out on the 1st of March. Dee was kind enough to both translate and record the last words of Aya Masawi for this episode. I'll leave a link to their podcast in the description. Aya Masawi was born in 1997 in Barqa al Gabiya in Israel. Barqa al Gabiya is a Palestinian village divided by the separation wall. Her Palestinian Muslim family included her mother Kitman, her father Saeed Masawi, as well as her three other sisters, Ruba, Lina and Noor. Noor and Saeed worked in China in Saeed's firm, whilst Ruba, Lina, Aya and their mother Kitman stayed in Israel. But the family were close. The Masawi family were reported often by media, wrongly, as being Israeli. I use the name Israel only as a geographical point. The Masawis have said that they are humans first, Muslims second, Arabs third, and finally Palestinian. Having Israeli passports was a clear result of their political situation, knowing full well in their hearts that they are Palestinian. Aya, like her sisters, was an excellent student, receiving excellent marks in her secondary education in Israel allowing her the freedom to follow in her sister Noor's footsteps with her tertiary studies at Shanghai University, undertaking a business degree and intending to work later at her father's firm in China with Noor. 
She was fluent in Arabic, Hebrew, and in Mandarin. And in late 2017, she was offered the opportunity to take part in a 10-month student exchange program, either in New York or in Australia, in Melbourne. Aya chose to come to Australia, thinking that Melbourne was more culturally diverse, and began studying at La Trobe University in August 2018. She was most concerned with improving her English communication and focusing on attending events created over a popular website Meetup, where people would get together and practice their English in social settings, whether it be in bars or playing games, or attending other events like stand-up comedy or music. Aya loved living and studying here, and her family were looking forward to coming and visiting her in Australia. Aya was a friendly, optimistic, kind young woman who had her whole adult life ahead of her. She was a loving and much-loved member of the Masawi family, and like many young people, wished for peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Cody Herman was born in September 1998 to a First Nations mother and a German father, both of whom were only 19 at the time. Cody had an older sister, Ruby. Due to his mother's drinking issues and abuse, Cody was brought to the attention of social workers by the time he was six months old, resulting in Cody's temporary removal from his parents. This was a result of a violent scuffle between his parents, which ended up with Cody's father throwing a television at Cody's mother, which ended up falling on Ruby. By the time Cody turned one, his mother had left him in the care of a relative, whose own kids had been taken away by a judge, owing to severe mistreatment. Six months later, Cody was once more placed in foster care and admitted to the hospital with scabies. Cody came to the attention of welfare agencies multiple times through the course of the first uh, 18 months of his life, while residing with one or both of his parents. Because of their ongoing drug and alcohol usage, domestic and emotional abuse, and failure to provide for his basic necessities, including sufficient food. Cody and his sister experienced such severe physical neglect that they had gastrointestinal issues, uh, decayed teeth, and skin conditions as a result of poor hygiene. Additionally, both kids had delays in their developmental milestones. You know, things like uh, first words, first sentences, and using syllables. There's no doubt that the environment in which Cody lived for the first three years of his life was one of extreme physical and emotional deprivation. Midway through 2001, when Cody's mother took him and his sister to Perth, his father reported her for assaulting the kids and regularly abusing alcohol. Due to that, both children were taken from their mother and placed in the care of a resident in Bandura, and this was eventually made permanent. Cody's father did not want to see any of his children at all after arriving in Melbourne with his new girlfriend. From around the age of six, Cody's father had played a very small part in his life, and Cody barely remembers him. Additionally, over the years, Cody's mother showed little interest in keeping in touch with him. Although she was meant to have regular access visits, she frequently postponed them, skipped them, or showed up drunk. Cody started attending school in 2004 and quickly started acting in ways that were problematic. He had troubles with his self-esteem and rage and was considered to be emotionally brittle. He had a hard time making friends and navigating social place scenarios, struggling with self-control and frequently acting aggressively or rough with other kids. Cody also didn't pay too much attention in class and was known to have constant nightmares and slept in the fetal position. When Cody was 13 years old, his mother passed away. That was accompanied by a gradual deterioration in his behaviour. Problems with rage, drug and alcohol misuse and skipping school started to surface and Cody began associating with people who were, let's say, a bad influence on him. By late 2014, around the age of 16, Cody had started leaving his foster home and occasionally sleeping on the streets. The police became engaged after he went missing for around a month in April 2015. Even though he went back to his foster family, there were clear conflicts there, and by the end of the year, the placement was no longer working. But Cody would still return to the foster home occasionally after that. Cody's first known interaction with mental health services was in November 2016, when he was sent as an inpatient to Origin uh, Youth Health, because he was severely psychotic. A fortnight after beginning to take an antipsychotic drug, he was released. Cody had more interactions with mental health services in 2017, including a subsequent hospitalisation in July 2017, and noted that his daily thoughts were starting to become paranoid. Cody regularly stopped taking medication against recommendation and did not interact well with treatment teams. Cody's drug-induced psychosis appeared to be what led to those interactions with mental health services. 
He'd experimented with a variety of illegal substances since he was in his early teens, but meth and cannabis were what he used regularly and heavily. Over the second part of 2017, Cody's mental health deteriorated due to increased drug use and paranoid thoughts. He was having trouble in school and was living in transitional housing for young people. Cody eventually left school midway through year 11 and left the temporary housing in June 2018, around the same time. He had the intention at this stage of going back to his foster mother, but because he was unable to stop taking drugs, he eventually left the foster home again and began living homeless in September of that year. Around the same time, Cody broke up with his girlfriend and in December, he attempted suicide. Cody's friends were limited to a small group of people, all of whom were also abusing drugs, and Cody was not particularly close to anybody. In January 2019, Cody was squatting in an abandoned, condemned house in Greensboro, estranged from his foster mother and biological sister. His sole source of income, Centrelink Benefits, was largely spent on drugs, and Cody fed himself by shoplifting from supermarkets. He lived on a diet of croissants and chocolate milk, with a lifestyle in constant pursuit of weed and meth. He posted on two Facebook accounts, usually things about his non-existent rap career, or thinly veiled allusions to drugs and occasionally suicide. His rap name was MC Codes, and in early January, MC Codes put up a post saying that he had demons in his mind. On the 3rd and 9th of January 2019, Cody attempted to enter nearby student accommodation, the same accommodation where Aya Masawi lived. Later reports suggest that this was not linked to what happened later, and that Cody was more likely either looking to rob someone or sleep in the building. Cody tried to gain access into the apartment building and told students that he'd lost his key. He was also observed standing on the grass outside the building. That being said, on the 8th of January, Cody posted on Facebook, International Girl of Mystery, you knows who you are. Aya Masawi's friends think that this was indeed a reference to Aya, as a suggestion that Cody had seen her many times. A few days before, a friend discovered him asleep on the bedroom floor of his foster mother's home in Grimshaw Street, where Cody Herman told him, Bro, I just had five psychoses. I saw a murder in my head. When he wasn't out scoring meth on most evenings, Cody hung around the Polaris shopping centre in Bandura, and Tuesday 15th of January 2019 was no different. Aya Masawi had had a really good evening. She practiced her English by attending the regular Let's Talk in English meetup event in the city, and then afterwards had gone to the Comics Lounge in North Melbourne to see some comedy, and again, practice her English. She was five months into her 10-month study exchange at La Trobe University from Shanghai University, and she was having a great time learning English and practicing her social communication at these events, and was getting really good at it. She was looking forward to showing her sisters around when they came to visit later in the year. After the show, one of her friends dropped her off at Berg Street to catch the 86 tram home to her student accommodation in Bandura. As the time clocked after midnight and into the morning of Wednesday 16th of January, Aya got off the tram on Plenty Road. She crossed the road and began walking east along the footpath of Main Drive Bandura next to the Polaris shopping centre. She'd walked this area many times before, and because of what had happened in the past to women like Eurydice Dixon or Jill Ma, she decided to call Noor, her sister, on FaceTime. Talking to someone on the phone made her feel safer and meant that people wouldn't try to talk to her in the dark of night. Unfortunately, Noor didn't answer, so Aya decided to try one of her other sisters, Ruba, at home in Israel. She barely walked 100 metres or so when Ruba picked up. Ruba said, Hello, my sister. And Aya replied, I didn't expect you to pick up the phone. At 12.07, after asking a man for a cigarette, Cody Herman left the Polaris shopping centre through the car park onto Main Drive. Shortly thereafter, he saw Aya Masawi walking towards him. She'd only walked maybe 100 metres since getting off the tram. Before Ruba had a chance to respond to Aya, she heard a blood-curdling scream, followed by the sound of a scuffle and Aya yelling, Intihara! You piece of shit. She then heard four loud noises, like someone being hit, and then everything went quiet. Cody Herman had taken his opportunity. He grabbed Aya on the footpath and struck her over the head with a metal pipe four times. Aya dropped her phone and fell to the ground, unconscious. She never regained consciousness. Ruba, still on the line, heard Aya screaming and then everything went quiet. Having incapacitated Aya, Cody Herman dragged her body behind a low hedge between the footpath and the car park. He removed some of her clothing and raped her. 
Once he was finished, he struck her at least nine times more to the head with the metal pipe with severe force, causing multiple fractures to her skull and face and lacerations to her brain. At some stage, her neck was also injured, but it's not possible to say whether that was caused by Cody trying to choke her or in the process of Cody dragging her. Ayam Masawi died from these catastrophic head injuries. It's highly unlikely that she would have been alive after suffering such severe head and brain trauma. Knowing that Aya was dead, Cody then dragged her further behind the hedges to the location where her body was ultimately found. He sprayed her with WD-40 fluid from an aerosol can and, using a lighter, set fire to her clothing and body, attempting to destroy evidence that might implicate him in the attack. Cody then fled the scene, taking Aya's purse with him. Around half past midnight, CCTV footage showed him climbing the fence of the nature reserve on the south side of Main Drive. The black cap he'd been wearing with 1986 on the front was caught on the barbed wire at the top of the fence, so Cody left it there. As Cody moved south through the reserve, he discarded his bloodstained grey and black t-shirt, the WD-40 can and the metal pipe. He then climbed the fence at the southern end of the reserve, crossed Plenty Road and entered Bundura Park, where he discarded Aya's purse and its contents. He then fled the area. Throughout that period, Aya's phone call to her sister, Ruba, remained connected. Ruba became concerned by what she had heard and because Aya had stopped responding to her. The phone stayed connected for 72 minutes. Over the next few hours, Ruba and her sister Noor, who was living in China, made several unsuccessful attempts to contact Aya by text message. Around 7am, Noor called Victoria Police to alert them to what Ruba had heard and to ask them to check on Aya. While the family feared Aya was in danger and had now reported her missing, they hoped with all of their hearts that she would be found safe and alive in the home away from the home that she'd grown to love. Unfortunately, a short time later, a news report flashed across North's screen, reporting on the body of a woman found in Melbourne, Australia. Window washers had found the body near a hedge uh, near the entrance to their work in the car park of the Polaris shopping centre. News crews were on the scene filming the area where the body had been found. Suddenly, the camera zoomed in on a pair of shoes that had been carelessly tossed on the side of the road. Noor's heart sank. She knew those shoes. They were Ayers. The news report then zoomed in on her phone. It was also Ayers. The Masawi family's worst nightmare had come true. Reporting on the crime began immediately following the discovery of the body. The deaths of Jill Maher and Eurydice Dixon were still fresh in the minds of the Australian public and the media flocked to the location where Aya's body had been found, not even a kilometre from her student accommodation. Aya had sustained significant head injuries and there were burn marks on her body. A homicide investigation began immediately and the brutal and horrific murder of an international student drew outrage from people in Australia and around the world. CCTV footage from the tram were immediately requested by police. Police and state emergency service crews made a painstaking line search of Main Drive and then crossed over to Bundura Park on the other side of Plenty Road. Crews on Wednesday night scoured scrubland and walked through the park, hunting for evidence while people were enjoying their dinner and children were playing. Police forensic teams discovered evidence including Cody's 1986 baseball cap, his blood-soaked shirt and Aya's purse. These items were sent off for testing. After Aya had been identified by items from her purse, her last known whereabouts were investigated, and CCTV footage was requested from the Comics Lounge in North Melbourne. Further CCTV footage was obtained from the shopping centre and nearby residences. Witnesses were questioned, as were known sex offenders in the area. Police were unsure whether Aya had been stalked from the Comedy Lounge in a similar fashion to Eurydice Dixon's murder, or whether it had been a random opportunistic attack under the cover of darkness. When the Polaris Shopping Centre's CCTV arrived, homicide detectives watched a young man hanging around the shopping centre, identified by the black 1986 cap and grey and black shirt they had found nearby. They saw that the young man didn't have the metal pipe with him during that evening of the attack, suggesting that he'd either found it or had stashed it somewhere, along with the WD-40. Other CCTV footage from the early learning centre next to where Aya was found saw the same young man climbing the fence where his black cap was later found. Due to his drug use and vagrancy, the man was known to local police and a number of officers were able to identify him quickly as Cody Herman. Importantly, they also knew where he hung out. On Friday the 18th of January, police began investigating Cody's last known locations, including his foster mother's house on Grimshaw Road, Bundura and other nearby shopping centres. A park near a condemned abandoned property in Greensboro was identified as a possible location for Cody and sure enough he was found there at 11am. As he was arrested, Cody told the arresting officers 
that he didn't kill no one. He was taken to the Docklands police station for questioning by homicide detectives and maintained that he had not killed or raped anyone. He couldn't explain how his DNA and fingerprints came to be on so many crime scene items. Eventually, after a long time of questioning, Cody Herman came clean. He told detectives that he'd killed and murdered the girl in Mandura. He was taken into a waiting police car and driven out to Bandura to walk and talk police through what had happened on the evening of Tuesday 15th of January into the morning of Wednesday 16th of January. Cody couldn't explain where he'd got the metal pole or the WD-40, although evidence suggested he'd stashed it nearby, whether for protection or for these crimes. Police were satisfied and Cody was formally charged with murder and taken back into custody in preparation for arraignment the next day. Meanwhile, Saeed Masawi arrived from Israel to formally identify the body of his middle daughter. Aya's older sister Noor also travelled to Melbourne. On the same day, vigils were held at La Trobe University and on the steps of Victorian Parliament. A specially arranged 86 tram left the tram stop in the city where Aya had left her friends, and many people followed the same route Aya had taken on the night of her death. Flowers filled the tram and were left on Main Drive in Bandura, near where Aya had been found. Aya's father Saeed attended both vigils. He expressed gratitude for the support his family had received from the community and police and said that Aya was an amazing person with big opinions. Saeed waited until the crowds had left to inspect the tribute to his daughter, a framed photograph surrounded by candles and flowers. He also asked media organisations for the spelling of the name to be changed to AYA instead of AIIA, which police have been using based on her passport information to reflect their wish for her to be identified as Palestinian. I am sad because this is the last place my daughter... ...was here. One month I tell her, Father, maybe you can go to Sydney to enjoy and to see more love. But Father, she said, I will wait for you. When you come, we will go together. Continuing with their tradition of ignoring the plight of Palestinian people around the world, neither the Israeli president or Israeli prime minister sent their condolences to the family. On Saturday the 19th of January, 20-year-old Cody sat silent during a brief arraignment hearing at Melbourne Magistrates Court, dressed in a green t-shirt. The court heard that he'd also been charged with rape. Particulars of the rape charge were not released at the time, as Aya's family had not yet been told of the nature of the rape. A mental health assessment was requested for Cody, who made no bail application and was remanded to reappear on Monday the 21st of January. When Magistrate John Doherty asked Cody if he knew what he'd been charged with, he replied, yes. Doherty continued, it's alleged you murdered Aya Masawi and it's alleged you raped that person. Liaison officers had earlier tried to prevent Cody from being brought up to the cells to the courtroom for the hearing, but his honour intervened and requested the accused appear. When he entered the court, Cody sat with his head bowed and avoided eye contact with those sitting in the mostly empty room. On either side of him sat security officers with no friends or family attending the hearing. On Monday the 21st of January, Cody once again appeared in the Magistrates Court where the committal date was made for the 7th of June. When asked how he pleaded to the charges of rape and murder of Aya Masawi, Cody paused, stroked his beard and declared not guilty. There was stunned silence before his lawyer, Tim Marsh, asked for a moment with Herman, who stood in the dock at the back of the court. After a brief conversation, Mr Marsh asked that Herman be rearranged. He then answered guilty. When asked again about the rape and the murder charges, both times answering twice after getting ahead of their questions. On the same day, the coroner released Aya's body to her family, and some of the family and dozens of other supporters gathered at the Albanian Saki Islamic Centre in Dandenong, in Melbourne's southeast. She underwent a janaza, an Islamic cleansing ritual, before an outside prayer service took place. The many cards and messages left at the Bandura site where Aya was found were compiled into a book which Saeed Masawi took back to Israel with him, along with his daughter's body, on Tuesday the 22nd of January. On Wednesday the 23rd of January, her coffin was transported to the local mosque in her hometown of Barka al Gabia, where prayers were held for her. Cars jammed the streets, many displaying black flags in <coughs> cars jammed the streets, many displaying black flags in mourning for Aya. After prayers, Aya's coffin was carried out by close family members draped in silver cloth and lowered into the ground. Mourners also gathered along the sandstone walls of Aya's old school in Barka al Gabia, as relatives and neighbours filed into her family's home to offer condolences. Meanwhile, for the first few months after his arrest, 
Cody Herman was kept in isolation because of concerns about suicide risk. After his release into the regular prison population, Cody was held in protection units in order to protect him from other prisoners who had found out about his crimes from media reports. Whilst he showed remorse for what had happened to Aya, Herman also told medical professionals that he had gained a safe place to sleep, where he got fed three times a day, as well as having a regular shower. He also expressed hope that one day, following good behaviour in custody, that he might get to be in a prison that has good educational programs. The defence barrister opened the Supreme Court hearing in late 2019 by telling the court that it was his task to explain why Cody Herman, with no prior convictions and no history of violence, would viciously bash a young woman with a metal pipe, rape and murder her, and then try to set her body on fire. Marsh conceded that he would ultimately fall short in this task, telling Justice Hollingworth that there was no explanation that he could give. However, he continued by asking the court to consider Cody's background in some detail to understand how he became to be the seriously damaged young man who committed these offences, beginning with Cody's welfare records, which amounted to more than 2,000 pages in his file kept by the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency. Cody was assessed by Associate Professor Andrew Carroll, a forensic psychiatrist, and Associate Professor Warwick Brewer, a consultant neuropsychologist. In addition to assessing him in person, both experts had the benefit of having access to Cody's entire welfare file and other mental health records, and compiled comprehensive reports for the court. Dr Carroll also gave oral evidence for the better part of a day. These reports found Herman's IQ within the average range, with some mild deficits in verbal comprehension and memory and organisational ability. Previous psychotic episodes were chalked up to drug-induced psychoses rather than schizophrenia. The agreed diagnosis for Cody at the time of the offending was severe personality disorder. The availability of the history of Cody's life in the form of the welfare file enabled Dr Carroll to trace the likely development of Cody's personality disorder from childhood into adolescence and early adulthood. The report suggested that particular deficits which Cody displayed include chronic emotional disconnection, distorted assumptions regarding other people's attitudes and intentions, chronic hyperarousal and hypervigilance, and a sense of disassociation from the world. However, Dr. Carroll could not point to any single critical factor that created the ultimate breakdown of inhibition on the night of Aya's murder. He believed that a number of factors likely reinforced each other in compromising Cody's already fragile executive functioning capacity, including a number of humiliating or violent experiences involving so-called friends in the preceding weeks and months, the unresolved effects of a previous relationship breakdown, the ongoing effects of regular alcohol and drug use, worsening of mood with depression, hopelessness and some suicidal ideation, and the poor state of his physical health, including a degree of chronic starvation. Dr. Carroll said that Cody's profound personality dysfunction and his accumulative anger towards the world, particularly women, led to him committing this angry type of sexual homicide. Before sentencing, the court heard victim impact statements from Saeed and Kita Masawa, as well as their sisters Noor, Ruba and Lena. In these statements, the family spoke about the devastating effects of losing Aya. At times, they feel that they are stuck in a nightmare. Aya's death left an enormous hole in their lives. Not only was her future destroyed, but Cody also ended her family dreams of sharing their lives and growing old together. Ruba, in particular, feels like she's let Aya down by being unable to tell what was happening during the phone call. Aya's family wanted people to remember the joy that she brought to other people's lives, not the way in which she died. Considerable time was spent during the plea hearing addressing what, if any, effect Cody's history and various diagnoses should have on his sentence. The court found that Cody's personality disorder reduced but did not remove the need for general deterrence of a similar crime. However, legally a personality disorder is not considered a mental impairment that can be taken into consideration when sentencing in Victoria. In particular, Her Honor said that women should feel free to walk the streets alone without fear of being violently attacked by strangers and that Cody's sentence had to reflect the court's denunciation of his terrible crimes. On the third and final day of the plea hearing, Cody produced a handwritten letter of apology addressed to Aya's family. Your daughter didn't deserve such a terrible and tragic thing to happen to her. I don't expect any forgiveness because I will never be able to forgive myself and I will be trying to make amends for the rest of my life. Don't give in to hate like I did. Love. Goodbye. Aya's family was not present in court during the plea hearing. In the end, on the first charge of rape, Cody Herman was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment. 
on the second charge of murder, Cody Herman was sentenced to 32 years imprisonment. Her Honor ordered that four years of the sentence on charge one be served cumulatively on the base sentence, making a total effective sentence of 36 years with a parole period of 30 years. Miss Masawi was physically small, unsuspecting and alone. Seeing you only moments before you first struck her, she had no opportunity to flee or defend herself. You struck her with the clear intention of killing her, not merely injuring her. Miss Masawi was doing nothing more than walking along a public street on her way home from a night out, as she had every right to do. Whenever a woman is brutally attacked by a stranger in public, understandably it causes other women to feel less safe going about their ordinary daily lives. After sentencing, prosecutors argued the sentence imposed by Justice Hollingworth was manifestly inadequate and wanted Herman to be jailed for life to protect the community and because, they argued, his rehabilitative prospects, <coughs> his rehabilitative prospects were too slim. But the Court of Appeal in 2021 dismissed the prosecutor's challenge and did not extend Herman's sentence. They wrote in their findings that, on any view, the sentence represented severe punishment. Speaking after the sentencing in 2020, Aya's father, Saeed, said the family were not focused on revenge when it came to the length of Cody Herman's sentence. Their hope was to focus on the positive things that were important to Aya. She was happy. She was positive. She liked the life. She liked to help anyone. She liked all the people, all the human. doesn't matter where and when. This is I want to remember Aya. Last year, Saeed Massawi announced the family's support of a special fellowship set up in Aya's name for Palestinian physicians to train in Israeli hospitals. He said that Project Rosanna showcased Aya's dream for the world, showing that Israelis and Palestinians can live and work together in harmony. He said it was fiercely important to her. Cody Herman is currently serving his sentence in Barwon Prison. He was eligible for parole in the year 2049. Thanks for your time today, I really appreciate you watching the whole video. Join me next time as we trawl through another episode in the true crime history of Australia. If you've enjoyed this video, once again please go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty broomstick and stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. It really helps us out. And remember, all of our episodes are released at the same time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm on Instagram at Something About Murder, and I respond to every message I receive. So I hope to hear from you, and I hope you don't get murdered. Stay safe out there. Bye.